Hi everyone, this is Brian Hayes and welcome to episode 23 of the Music Mind podcast. Today my special guest is Australian guitar legend Michael Fix. Michael has led an extraordinary career as a full-time professional musician based out of Brisbane, Australia. Please enjoy my conversation with the wonderful Michael Fix. Hi, Mike, and welcome to the Music Mind podcast. It's great to have you here today as my special guest for episode 23 in the series. Yeah, thanks, Brian. Thanks for uh, inviting me. Uh, Looking forward to the chat today. Our audience have just seen and heard a wonderful solo guitar piece called Marking Time. Can you tell us a bit about that piece, the background on that? Yeah, it was was kind of inspired by Mark Knopfler. When I say kind of... The basic sort of groove of it was kind of built on on this um, sort of. Which is a, a kind of a Knopfler technique, you know, and, yeah. and um, uh, you know, I love that the, there's a simplicity and, and there's a there's a groove to it. Um, but of course, the way my brain works is uh, uh, what if we can get this groove down and put a melody over the top of that? 
basically like a blues thing. So it's all built on. And then I added. And the idea is to keep that funky sort of bass thing going while having. Yeah, yeah. great. And, and so obviously uh, Mark Knopfler has been a huge influence around the world to a lot of guitarists. Primarily, I guess he's an electric guitar player. You primarily nowadays are an acoustic player. What's the background? Did you start out as an acoustic player or, or how did that all come about? Well, it, it um, uh, yeah, my first, first guitar was an acoustic guitar. I've never, I'd never sort of considered myself either an acoustic or an electric guitarist. From from the beginning, it was pretty much both. You know, where I had an acoustic guitar that my parents bought me for Christmas. Uh, I took off with it, and uh, they could see I was I was keen. And it was only a matter of you know a few months before I was eyeing off electric guitars in the local music store window. Yes, um, and. See, it was a, it was a time. This, we're, we're talking nineteen seventies here. It was a time when you would turn on the radio and guitar was king. Uh, every song featured mm. guitar, and it the top forty of the day included acoustic, folky music, singer songwriter, and it also included um, you know Led Zeppelin and, and Deep Purple and and heavy heavy rock sounds, and uh, it was just grist for the mill for me it, it was all guitar and I loved all of it whatever I, I heard on the radio that was kind of my my, my first um uh exposure to guitar was was top 40 radio do you have a a process for the want of a better word when you write or does it does it vary when you you are composing it it does vary um but the the compositions that I enjoy the most uh that 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 I still that I have a deep connection with are the ones that come from a very personal experience. So the experience, I guess the way I can explain it is this. Um, if, if I have a, a, an experience and it may be um, anything from uh, being in a spectacular place or, or being in an art gallery or, or, or a conversation I've had with somebody, anything that, that inspires some sort of emotional reaction Later on, I'll be reflecting on that, and it's like a movie running through my mind, and then I'm putting the soundtrack to the movie. That's probably the simplest way that I can explain my my process. They're they're the they're the best ones, I think. You know, for for me, the ones that that uh, that come from from within. But there are plenty of other tunes that a bit like marking time that um, came more from some ideas about, uh, you know, different sounds or styles that I like and, and how I could put them together. And they become almost a little bit more of a, of an academic exercise rather than a pure, you know, emotional thing. <laughs> do you largely play it as you recorded that? Or do you give yourself the freedom to say, Oh, look in the middle bit there, I can change that how I feel. What's your yeah. process there? Yeah. Yeah. Def definitely. Um, I'll definitely uh, have, that section that that is improvised that was improvised on the recording I, I probably did three or four takes and chose the one i liked um and when i play it live that that section is always different um and it's a sort of tune it lends itself to a um, bit of rearrangement on the fly as well i've, I've noticed um you know it sort of evolved over the last couple of years since i recorded it when i perform it i'll uh, um, I will change it. I will change the arrangement as I go as well. Okay, Michael, let's go right back to the beginning. When did you first get interested in music? What's your earliest memory of saying, oh, I want a part of this, this music? <laughs> I want to be, I want to be. Yeah, want to be. Um, <laughs> yeah look, uh, probably th there was a guitar at, at home. My dad played. And oh. so there was a guitar lying around. And just the fact that it was there, uh, kind of attracted me, <laughs> drew me like a magnet. Yeah. And, um, I don't really have a memory of my father playing. And it, it seems that he played when he was, um, you know, probably my around the time I was born. And um, my mum says he played, you know, when he was in his very early 20s. Um, but I don't have a memory of him 
playing as such. But once I started, he showed me some chords and he gave me a pile of his sheet music and, and I could see it had his handwritten uh, notes because he, he came from Germany. So some of the symbols um, uh, are different. But there's one there's one um, letter in the musical alphabet that they write differently in German, and he's, okay, it yeah. was all handwritten and some things crossed out. So I knew he yes. he must have taken it somewhat seriously. And uh, so the guitar was in the house, and uh, it wasn't long until it sort of found its way into my room. I guess I was about nine or ten years old, and um, okay, I, I couldn't sort of tune it or or play it at that at that point. But I I remember picking it up and and. Uh, plucking the strings and and trying to pick out a melody and going and going oh and then and then going to the next string <laughs> playing telling, it in five different keys that's right yeah, exactly that's right yeah, yeah. <laughs> any formal lessons or was it largely just finding your own path there um yeah it was from I, I think about age eleven, uh, that that was when it it got serious. They, uh, mum and dad saw I was really keen, so they they you know pulled all their money and went to, to Kmart and and bought <laughs> <laughs> bought me an audition guitar. Wow! I seem to okay. recall it cost twelve dollars. Well, um, okay. Anyway, yeah. armed with my new acoustic guitar, they they sent me off to to lessons. And there was a guy. I grew up in Wollongong, and there was a a guy there called Alan Phillips, who was a local jazz musician, and he had a, a teaching studio, and he called it uh, the Alan Phillips Guitar Academy. Yeah. And uh, I started going there, and uh, um, Alan wasn't my my first teacher. My first teacher was a um a, a young fellow who was uh, I think I was 11 and this guy the teacher was about 15 yeah um but uh, I remember he had a he had a, a white fender mustang and and it was the coolest thing I'd ever seen oh, in my life yeah and um and he took me through the the Mel Bay course yes and, uh, which which I really loved it it suited my, the way my brain worked, I liked the the sort of the linear, the process of uh, starting down here and learning the notes and the names of the notes and being able to read simple music and then learning the scale and the chords that fit the scale. Yes. And then slowly moving up the neck. And, um, you know, I really, I really took to that, but, but in between um, uh, this uh, guy, to um, Tony, my, my teacher was, uh, he'd, he'd do things like, uh, <laughs> And yeah, show me things like that, and uh, right, and yeah. basic rock and roll riffs. Yeah, and, and I was off. You know, I was uh, totally hooked. Um, what a and, lucky break there that you, you you found some teachers right from the get go that introduce you to music notation and the names of the notes. Yeah, and yeah. a lot of guitar mm. players, even some of the best in the world, as you know, are completely just playing by ear and that's fantastic but i think i do think there's a missing link particularly if you play with instruments other than guitars if you're the only one in the room that really doesn't know yeah. how, to, how to read basic music and that sort of stuff you know yeah well later on I, um after a couple of years I, I sort of graduated to to having alan as my teacher and his background was jazz and yeah and he he could he was playing all the cool chords and uh, and i wanted some of that you know and, yeah yeah. And uh, he, um, by that stage, you know, I'd been reading music through the Mel Bay course and um, he could write things down for me. And uh, and I kind of understood what, what was happening. And he, he showed me, um, you know, major sevens and minor sixes and all these chords. Mm. And I, I understood how, how they were formed and um, I could relate the scale to the chord. And, and that, that, um, I didn't realize until much later that that's not how most guitar players learn, Correct. especially young players, you know, is yeah. it's the, 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 one of the beauties of this instrument is that um, it's very quick and easy to get going because you learn a couple of uh, bar yes. chord shapes and, and yes. you're up and you're playing yep. songs you're hearing on the top 40. And yep. it, after a, a year or two, you, it's easy to convince yourself that you're a guitar player. And <laughs> how true! I've, I've still got those books here yeah. in my my bookshelf, yes. and I look at yeah. them. And I go, "Gee, that this is corny stuff." You know, the tunes that I was learning. Oh, yeah. But I have such great memories of it. It was such a sense of achievement to to go through a you know a chapter a week. And um, the thing with 
with my my guitar teacher with uh, Alan was um, he had a really great way of inspiring uh, players, particularly mm -hmm. uh, you know the way it re he related to me. Um, he would always play something at the end of a lesson, mm -hmm. um, something really cool that he knew he must have known is that I, I would I would love it. And I remember once he played this this little blues minor blues thing. <laughs> about you know 14 and and i'm i'm like oh can you, sh you sh please show me that show me that and he'd yeah. say well oh, if you get through these pages this chapter <laughs> by next week um you'll be ready for that you know yes. and, uh, <laughs> what yeah. a wonderful thing though to <laughs> to sit two meters across from someone who was much better on your instrument than you at the time but, yeah, but inspiring yeah. you, I suppose, in that way, in, in a gentle way, bribing you to work <laughs> hard on the course. I want to talk more about that, but I want to play a fair bit of your music today. I want to just go forward a little bit. There's a great clip of you with a band called Hat Trick. Now, I'm assuming, is this around 1980 or what time? This is Toccata and Fugue in D minor. To me, it sounds like inspired maybe by John Williams' Sky, that band he had. Is that correct? It's that era? Yeah, yeah. Um, so I, I moved up to Sydney uh, in the very early 80s, mainly due to the recommendation and, and uh, of my friend Tommy Emmanuel, who uh, I yeah. I'd started traveling up to Sydney and, and seeing Tommy. And um, he uh, he was a great, great mentor, still is, you know, he's yeah, wonderful, yeah. Um, really encouraged me to, to make the move to Sydney. Um, so I was doing a few things around Sydney in the early 80s, starting a, a bit of a – I wanted to be a session player. That was my my big ambition okay. at the time. And I, and I started getting into some session work. And uh, I, I toured with Reg Lindsay for a, for a year or so. Yes. Um, and uh, I can't remember the exact time. It was probably about 1983, 84, probably 84, I think, when I came across Hat Trick. They were actually looking for a bass player. Okay. Um, uh, there was uh, uh, another band that I played with around that time was the Bushwhackers, and yes. Roger Corbett, who was you know one of the key members of the Bushwhackers. Um, I think the band they they just finished up, and he went and joined Hattrick as a bass player and was with them for for a couple of years. And when he left, um, he let me know about it, and he said, um, you know, these guys will be looking for someone. I'm, I'm leaving the band, or, you know, getting the Bushwhackers back together, blah blah blah, mm. and. Um, I went and saw them and they were, they were amazing. Um, they played a, a mixture. It was such an odd mixture, of, but it, it kind of signifies to me what, what music was like the, the, the healthy music scene we had in the 1980s. Mm. And here was a band playing with two fiddles in the band, um, playing Celtic rock, like Steel Ice Span, Fairport Convention, that style of thing, yes. but also playing classical pieces yeah. Uh, in the style of Sky, as you mentioned. And uh, this was such a, an interesting and eclectic bunch of music. I thought, uh, i I, I got to join this band. Well, this is fantastic. Let's <clears throat> let our audience have a look and listen to Bach, you know, true classical music, but played in a very contemporary style. You're on electric guitar here. I think yep. you're playing straight plectrum guitar in this, are you? Or, yeah, yeah. yeah? Flat, yep. And uh, it's only four pieces, only the one violinist in this clip.
that was very much an electric guitar style and plectrum guitar. But there is a clip I want to show, Demolition Derby. You're out front of a country band. You're playing a mate on a beautiful mate on acoustic guitar and your right hand technique has very much shifted to the the thumb pick and fingers by this stage. Can you talk a little bit about how that move came about? And and I, it seems like you've made that change and largely stuck with that change for the rest of your career. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Um, well, I was playing sort of finger picking guitar through my teens in addition to to flat picking. Um, I didn't think about it in terms of, uh, you know, choosing one or what, what my focus was going to be. It was really just kind of what worked for particular songs. And, um, you know, we didn't have YouTube in those days. So I'd hear something on the radio and, um, you could kind of guess, oh, this is, this is finger picking rather than strumming. And, and, you know, I could figure things out like that. Um, but in, in my teens, later teens, uh, about the age of 18, I, I traveled to Sydney. Uh, I was traveling to Sydney regularly just to see what was going on in the music scene. I ended up in a club called the Musicians Club in uh, Chalmers Street. And that's where I met um, Rex Go, ah. uh, who was playing with uh, Leon Berger. And they, they became a real favorite haunt of mine. Whenever I had the chance, I would go up with a couple of friends from Wollongong and we would go and see Leon Berger. And there would usually be two bands on. And... Um, Rex had uh, alerted me to um, this other guitar player to, I should check out. His name was Tommy Emmanuel. And um, it turned out that Tommy was also playing the Musicians Club. He was playing with Doug Parkinson at that time. So yeah. I um, made sure I caught caught them one night. And um, in the in the middle of the um, performance, when the, the band took a break, uh, Tommy came out, sat on a stool and... Uh, played some solo guitar. He played um, some Beatles, I think. Mm. And, um, and that was, that was finger style. He, he might've played. Um... Lady Madonna. Yeah. yeah. Something like that. He, I know mm. he played here, there and everywhere. And mm. the people, the crowd just went bananas, you know, they absolutely loved it. And it was. They still do, Michael. They oh still yeah. Do. <laughs> but, uh, you know, sort of in that very early stage, yeah. sort yeah. of reaction. Yeah. Yeah, and, and yeah. The, the effect it had on me. Um, mm. Thing was, for me, the the only exposure I'd had to seeing somebody sort of finger picking a guitar was in the, the classical world. I'd seen uh, you know classical performers and mm. on TV as well, and um, uh, I, I kind of realised that this is something. This is the classical world wasn't going to be for me. That was a bit too too much discipline involved, mm. and I was you know my. I was being torn all over the place by all sorts of, you know, music I was hearing. Yeah. And uh, and what Tommy was doing was something brand new for me, uh, playing finger picking Beatles, playing the melody, playing the bass line. Mm. Jeez, that that that's that's something I've got to get into. So I started to see him regularly at, at the musicians club, and um, asking for lessons. And uh, he, he was I didn't realize at the time how busy he was. He was a busy guy, you know, yeah. very very busy guy, but he, he saw that I was super keen. And so he invited me to his place and, uh, we sat down and first uh, question was, um, have you heard of Chet Atkins? And I hadn't, and he put a record on, um, and this, the tune that was playing. tune called Liebestraum. Yeah. And, uh, all the, the elements are there um, of, of that that Chet bass, that that, um, that muted percussive bass, the melody singing over the top. And I genuinely um, thought I was listening to two players. Absolutely. Um, and, of course, uh, you know, Tommy then <laughs> played it for me. And when you see what's possible as well as hear it, you know, it, it's, it's quite mind blowing when it's there right in front of you. And, and that really, uh, that was like the, the light bulb came on and um, uh, it, that's what I really wanted to do. I sort of dedicated, well, the rest of my life to, to that style is it, it, it sort of um, what, what it signified for me was if I could, 
if I could master that or, or learn that style and I, I could be a one man band, I had this sort of very naive uh, image in my mind of me traveling the world with a suitcase and a guitar and being able to play anywhere in the world because it wasn't singing. There were no lyrics, um, you know, no play. language barriers, yeah, yeah, all of that yeah. stuff. And, uh, and and that's the the dream that I pursued then. Well, dreams come true. I just want to talk a, a couple of things there. First of all, for fans of the podcast, there's a wonderful episode with Rex Go, and uh, Rex yeah. talks at some length about meeting Tommy Emmanuel and having lessons with Tommy. And the thing that I remember that Rex said that from the very first lesson with Tommy, it was all about playing tunes, mm -hmm. not playing scales, not playing fancy chords. It was. He would give Rex, a, he'd play a little bit of a tune and yep. Rex had a go away. Rex was allowed to have his cassette player on and Rex said he had a, Tommy expected him when he came back next week to be able to play that little part of the tune and then he'd help him if he couldn't, but they'd move on. I thought, isn't that a wonderful thing? And I guess Tommy, if there was ever a melody man, Tommy has yeah, spent his yeah. life playing melody. The other thing I just want to talk about, I had the honour of, of doing a, an episode with Karen Shorp, the wonderful Australian classical guitarist. She spoke at length about for her, it's interesting how you said the classical technique wasn't for you, uh, but the importance of the fingernails and the balance of flesh and nails. Now, just looking at, at your right hand, you don't appear to have a, an amazingly manicured set of nails. No, no. No. So for you, is it, she spoke at some length about, you know, the string travels up the, the nail and the flesh and everything. She's got such a wonderful classical technique. But you get your own sound there. Can you talk a little bit about that? Have you ever worried much about the fingernails, how you actually well, play in the right hand. Well, tell us that story. Yeah, uh, look at at going back to teenage years. I went to an all boys school and and I dabbled in classical guitar for a okay. couple of years and I grew nails and yes, and, um, um, you know because I was doing other stuff with boys activities, the nails would break and uh, yes, yeah, um, and so I'd be painting them with <laughs> some varnish or something. Which yeah. wasn't a good look in a boys' school. Not really, no. <laughs> <laughs> but it just all seemed like too much hard work, you know. Yeah. And uh, the, the discipline of the classical guitar world, um, as as I mentioned, it, it didn't didn't appeal to me, even though I loved the sound of, of oh, yeah. classical yeah. guitar. Yeah. But um, so I stayed on steel strings, and uh, once I sort of got into this um, style of playing, you know, I didn't have a great tone to begin with, mm. and. Um, it, it all depended on the more I played, the tougher those calluses got. Yeah. And when those calluses are firm, mm. you start to get, you know, some volume and some tone out of the guitar. Yes. And the sound that I liked, that I was kind of hearing in my head that I was going for was sort of halfway between nylon string and, and steel string. So have some of the warmth of a nylon string, but at the attack of the steel string. Yes. So I used nails on on... I find that a little a little harsh. But if I use fingers using the, the calluses, that's a much rounder tone. And, and that's the sound of it. Right.
when yep. you're playing a, a complex melody like Demolition Derby, how much of that is absolute muscle memory or, or are you sort of singing that melody in your mind as you're playing or is that just, I have played that a thousand times, I know it by mechanical memory. What, what, what's that for you? That Yeah, in, in a piece like that, there's definitely a, a muscle memory thing. Um, it's like you can't <laughs> you can't stop and think about it. Um, it, it. It's you know one of the the challenges for for all all players and performers is to get inside a, a song or a tune mm. uh, to to play it to play something without any uh, self consciousness, I guess. Um, and you can only achieve that through repetition to get that muscle memory to a point where. Uh, it it happens automatically and and it it can flow out and you you don't have to um, be thinking and you can allow yourself to feel something. Mm. Uh, I, I wouldn't say um, you know demolition derby is my most sort of emotive. <laughs> no, no emotive piece. It was very much about about the flash and the sort of thing I was influenced by at the time. The Jerry Reed and uh, yes, yeah, and uh, you know some of the country pickers I was listening to. Um, you know, I guess when I think about it, over the, over the years, uh, all this stuff, all my my compositions are a kind of a an an album representing where I am at that point in my life, what my what I'm listening to, what I'm doing, where I've been. Yeah, uh, like a, and some people keep scrapbooks and photo albums, and you know, I you do albums, musical <laughs> albums, yeah. <laughs> Just to give the audience a bit of an idea, obviously at that stage of the game, you're an advanced guitarist. You, you know, I assume you're playing professionally, or or were you balancing your music career with some outside employment to put pizzas? Uh, no, I've I have uh, never to this day uh, another job outside of music. <laughs> wow! Well, congratulations! What an effort! Well, so, it just shows I'm yeah. not good at anything else. Well, you're very good at what you're doing. So so with that in mind, in other words, you've got the guitar in your hands every day. To actually get a, work up a complex piece like Demolition Derby to the point where you're confident you can go yep. on TV and you, you sort of know your way through it. Roughly, how, have you, can you put a, a timeline in hours on how much work on that specific song? I know it's all part of the overall work on your instrument, but to memorise that song, because that's a complex series of, of, of notes there, what, what, what sort of time would have you put in in advance to be able to play like that? Well, that was so long ago, I really can't remember. No, I think okay. I was playing a, a lot, you know, during during the day. Um, mm. It was So that was uh, in the 1990s. Um, you know, it probably was playing. I don't know, six hours a day at that at that stage. Yes, in, in the in the eighties, before I had family and mortgage, mm. and all that sort of stuff. Mm. Um, I was playing twelve hours or more a day. Yeah, and I only had um, I only had to work two nights a week to pay my rent and uh, yes. buy the groceries and buy petrol. Yeah, rest was practice time. And yeah. when you're young and you're fit, uh, yep. you fit. You can do it. Um, yep. As as I've gotten older, um, naturally, it gets it harder on my time mm. a more. Plus, mm. physically, you just can't sit in a chair and play for twelve hours without no, no, no. some some strain. Actually, I could kind of describe to you what my process is to get something to um, to a performance, yeah. if if you like. Absolutely, um, yeah. Because it's a it's a totally different thing from getting a piece of music that you can play in your bedroom to your own satisfaction. Yes. To get to a concert stage in front of an audience. Mm. Uh, um, I'll, I'll go through, I'll try and ex explain, cut a lot, very long story short. So yes. step one would be, I'm here in, in my room. This is my comfort zone here. Yes. Yeah. Um, I'm on my favorite comfy chair and I'm sitting down and I'm, I'm working out uh, an, an arrangement and, uh, or, or, a, or a new tune or whatever. Um, we can use, uh, I don't know. Well, we could use MacArthur Park as an example. Okay. Uh, Cause, um, so with something like that, you know, I'm learning, uh, I know the melody pretty well. I'm, I'm figuring out, uh, the mechanics of, um, where I'm going to play the chords, what, what key I'm going to play it in. You know, there'll be a bit of trial and error, a bit of experimentation. How high does it go? How low 
can I get the bass note? Can I get some open strings in there? That's all in the very early part, you know, a bit of time spent on figuring out a key, figuring out the, where it's going to fit on, mm. the, on the fingerboard, if you like. Yeah. Because uh, something like MacArthur Park has a huge range oh. uh, from high to low. Yeah. Um, and so I'll figure out what's the highest part of the song and it, you know, it goes up here. Well, that that's quite comfortable. Um, but I also mm. want to have a, you know, the bass, what am I going to do tune down or what, what will I do with the bass? Will it fit? Uh, once I've got that, that part down, I'll, I'll then work on the mechanics of the chords and the melody, how they're going to fit together. What position am I going to play the chords? So I'm still very much in a, in my head, you know, this, it's the puzzle. Mm. Putting the puzzle together, just figuring out the basic moves, um, trying a few variations, what feels right, what sounds good, you know. Um, now, this process, depending on the complexity of the song, this can take quite a long time. As in, can, as in weeks, potentially? Or, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. In, in yeah, the case, just the case of the park, it took mm. quite a long time. Mm. Um, it would have probably been a, a, over a few months. Yeah. But then it's then it's a question of um, okay now I'm committing to some to a sequence of chords and melody. I'm going to play it very very slowly. And and it's a process of of there's some repetition. There's some memorizing going on of uh, and figuring out connections. Um, you know, there's a climb up there and then it's going to go up here too. Figuring out what chord shapes will I play and, you know, all those, those things. I'm still in my, sitting in my chair, still in my comfort zone, still working out the mechanics. Now this this will go on until I can play the whole thing from beginning to end, and then I think, okay, now I've I've learnt the song, yeah. But now now I've got to get it so deep inside me mm. that I can play it whilst being distracted. So yes. I, I then start to put pressure on myself, and the first thing I might do is stand up and play it. Mm. Uh, because the feeling is different straight away. Yeah. So I'm already thinking now um, in terms of when I perform this, am I going to sit or am I going to stand? Most likely I'm going to stand. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, uh, lately I sort of sit down for half of it and stand up for half of it. <laughs> Why not? Yeah. Um, yeah. So if I'm going to stand up and play something, I want to, I want to practice it, rehearse it standing up. Absolutely. Is just to put your, it puts that thing into your head of something's different here. I feel a little bit awkward. What am I doing with my feet? You know, mm. uh, all this stuff, these distractions appear in, in your mind. Then I want to continue putting pressure on myself. And what I, what I might do is walk around while I'm playing. Yes. So that my body is doing one activity while my hands are doing something else. Yeah. Well, I'll, um, as I'm doing that, I'll look away. I'll look around my room. I'm, so I'm walking around. Yep. Yeah, not looking at the guitar. And, I, and uh, ultimately what I want to be able to do is have a conversation while I'm talking, uh, you know, while I'm playing. While you're playing it. So I'll, I'll, I'll annoy my, my wife. You know, she gets very annoyed by this um I'll she's your guinea out. pig. Yeah. Yeah. I'll walk out into the <laughs> kitchen right. while I'm playing. Yes. And she's there and, uh, and, and, uh, start having a conversation while I'm playing. And she's like, put the guitar away and talk to me. And say, no, this is really important. I need to do this. <laughs> um, so it's even yeah. better. You can have an argument while you're playing. Oh, you're still <laughs> <laughs> and we're going to look at your recorded version of MacArthur Park, which composed by Jimmy Webb, one of the all time great songwriters and, for fans, again, of the podcast, I've only recently done a great episode with Jamie Rigg, uh, who I believe you have done a yeah, bit of playing yeah. with. He's a great oh, yes. guy, Jamie. And yep. he tells a wonderful story about his meeting Jimmy Webb. And I'll let people look at that because it is a fascinating look at, at, at a superstar not being as comfortable as as you might have thought in, in mm. the environment that he was in. But it's very much, it's, it's, a, it's almost like a classical concerto. It's an orchestral yeah. arrangement. And you've been brave enough 
to bring that down to a solo acoustic guitar. I think I think that was a brave journey when you set out because you must have realized this is not a three chord twelve bar blues. <laughs> you know, this is this yeah, is going yeah. to take some work. One other thing I was just gonna say, you know, you're doing all that. A thing I often say to people is don't forget in many ways to have a dress rehearsal. If you always practice in a t-shirt short and, and thongs, but you're in a suit on stage, there's yeah. a big moment when all of a sudden, you know, you don't even feel comfortable reaching over the guitar with your, your clothes. Yeah, so, yeah. I, I mean, you've done it that often, but is that something you'd also recommend if you're... Oh, yeah. Beautiful? I remember for one of the tours in, in Europe, one of the early tours, I, I bought myself a, a new suit and uh, I was really pleased with it. It was quite lightweight and, yeah, and yeah. Uh, this would be great for traveling and it's not going to yeah. be too hot to play in. Um but I didn't do the dress rehearsal with the jacket on, okay. but put it on very proudly, put yeah. it on the first yeah. night, and then discovered that the buttons of the jacket were clacking ag against the oh. back of the guitar. And because the guitar's got a microphone in there, yeah. this clacking was coming out heavily <laughs> amplified. <laughs> So suddenly the <laughs> suddenly the coat had a, had a get ditched or whatever. Yeah, well, yeah. Then I <laughs> then I, I had these little um, material uh, padded material covers made that clipped over the top of them. Oh, the brilliant! <laughs> Let's have a look and a listen to you solo guitar, and we'll play the full version of this. This is a a beautiful example, I guess, of your musicianship, and in some ways, I think it goes back to how you first started learning, those little Mel Bay books. A lesser guitarist would be definitely scared off the work required, even to work out what the chords are in MacArthur Park for a start, let alone the melody. Let's have a, a, a look and a listen to Michael playing solo guitar on Jimmy Webb's famous MacArthur Park.
Now, you've had a long association with the Australian guitar brand Mayton. I was only reading the other day that Bill May and his brother first registered the business Mayton in 1946. Yeah. Wow. You know, they so made isn't that amazing? So, you yeah. know, that, that Australian for our international audience, Mayton are a wonderful brand of, of guitars. They've been around for close to 80 years. Now, what's your what's been your association with Mayton? Going back to the the 80s, uh, so this is in the Hattrick um, era, um, I was using a, an acoustic guitar in the band, which was, you know, this uh, at that time, uh, amplifying acoustic guitars was a, was a real issue. Mm -hmm. There were people, you know, music was getting louder, PAs were getting bigger. Uh, there were some players that I knew playing Takamini acoustic guitars and they were stuffing them full of cotton wool and to stop the feedback and all that. Yeah. I was using a solid body, uh, it's kind of a semi-hollow body uh, acoustic guitar and I had a, my my good guitar, my recording guitar was a, a Yamaha. Okay. Um, and I always thought, It'd be nice to have one guitar that could do both jobs well. Mm. And um, Maton seemed to fit the bill. They, they developed a pickup system that was uh, working well. And the connection was um, through Tommy. And there was uh, a meeting. I, I met um, Neville and uh, the guy who developed the uh, pickup system in, in the 1980s Matons. Uh, okay. Okay. This is the instrument they were taking around uh, with this um, the sort of timber surround. Yes. Um, it was their sort of demonstration model of a, a new Maton that was going to be uh, available. Uh, I can't, something came up in the conversation where, um, you know, they were talking to me about a Maton guitar and Tommy said, Michael should have this one. <laughs> <laughs> the and, demo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, next thing you know, it was mine. <laughs> oh, isn't that amazing? And uh, it's what a beautiful it, guitar. Yeah, it's been the most wonderful instrument. Uh, I, I use this a lot for recording. It's in the yes. uh, park clip. I, I use this, yeah, for that. tune down half a step. Um, and it's a bit of an unusual one, this a rare one. The serial number is one, number one. Uh, wow, so yeah, this one they made of, of this model, yes. Um, and it, it did the job that I was looking, I was looking, I was looking for a stage guitar that could also work as a recording guitar. You now have a, a custom Michael Fix model mate on, is that yes. the, the, the other guitar you were playing before? Yeah. Yes, it is. This um, is a beautiful guitar. This is quite a <clears throat> small body guitar, is it? Or how would you describe what, what's unique about this one? It's uh, the, the 808 shape, which is one of the standard um, Maton models. Okay. Which are a sm smaller. The, the other one is a Dreadnought. Yeah. And um, the uh, these are great for, for finger picking. The, there's something about the mid-range that uh, just works really nice. Uh, the, the melody notes just pop out nicely. The bass isn't uh, boomy yeah. in any way which can be a thing with dreadnought guitars if you're playing finger style. Yes. Um, and uh, the slightly smaller body just kind of fits nice, nice. Oh, under it's, it's, it's beautiful. Yeah. And, I, and we'll look yeah. at you play that guitar in, in a couple of clips later too. I want to move on to, well, Tommy Emmanuel. How, how could you not be a fan of Tommy Emmanuel? I'll just share a very quick story here. I went to, I've been to the USA a couple of times, most recently in, uh, 2019, thankfully before all the COVID stuff, I went to the NAM convention at in Los Angeles down there near Disneyland and I'd never been there before. And this is the biggest trade show you will ever see in the world, every type of instrument. And I'll never forget in amongst the Fender and Gibsons and Ibanezes and Larivae and everything else, Maton had a pretty humble little stand. In their stand were wall-sized posters of Tommy Emmanuel mm. playing a mate on. The crowd that hovered around that rather humble stand must have embarrassed the hell out of the, the Martin <laughs> crew who was over the road because yeah. Tommy's image was all that they needed to just attract acoustic fans. I've got to really congratulate you, mate. You, you are playing Avalon with Tommy Emmanuel, just the two of you, I'm sure Tommy would say you were playing at an equal level to him on that 
that concert stage. And mate, that is, I couldn't give you a better compliment than that. Tommy was smiling at you, loving it, and really just throwing the bone to you, letting mm. you have the centre stage. First of all, what's your? Do you have a memory of that performance, Avalon? <laughs> Tell us a bit about that. What did yeah, that feel the, like? You know, the the memory I have is so different from what what you see. Um, you know, when when that clip starts, uh, there's a bit of silly stuff going on. Love it, absolutely love it. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so what what happened just prior to me coming on the stage? Um, I'd, I'd played earlier in the day. It was a festival. There were a number of guitar players. So I had my my gear on the stage, which was consisted of my my little AER amplifier, yep. a, a little pedal board, and my cables. Yes. I used to – I play wireless now, but I used to run uh, cables. Yes. And the reason I went wireless is because of this very performance. Okay. Um, so there were a number of players all had their gear on the stage set yep. up. Tommy had told – told me beforehand i'll get you up to play and also joe robinson who who was there at the festival as well and we played a, a piece together the three of us right um so we were prepared for that now what happened was <laughs> when um when we all played our <clears throat> our thing there was a, there was a crew of of young uh sort of stage hand kind of people hmm. who um before tommy came on they went and got all the gear that was on the stage and swept it all into a pile at the back oh. of the stage. Oh, all the pedals, go. cables, amps, everything piled up in the back, uh, oh. of, you know, to keep to kind of clear the stage for Tommy. Yeah, yeah. So um, I'm backstage, I'm listening to Tommy, and, I, and I'm thinking uh, he's going to get me out soon. So I peek through the curtains. And my I gear. See, <laughs> where, where's my gear? You know, it's then I see this pile of stuff and and then I, I i'm picturing in my mind the embarrassment of being um, introduced yeah walking out on stage and standing there and going well what yeah. the hell do i do now where do i plug in mm. well, I, <laughs> so all this stuff is going through my head yeah i, I use a particular I, I was using a particular kind of cable not a black plain black cable it was it sort of had a texture and a color yeah and i could see it I could see my cables amongst all the other cables. So I, I mm. worked out in my mind a strategy of how I was going to walk out on stage, wave to the crowd whilst at the same time pulling my gear out, grabbing my cable, <laughs> and hopefully everything's plugged <laughs> in and getting, getting a sound. Yeah. And so what happened? That's, that's what happened. Tommy introduced me and I, I came out and um, oh. I'm sort of like looking very awkward and embarrassed and then fiddling around and, so I'm sort of standing there and I'm thinking, God, this how unprofessional is, is this, you know? Yeah, yeah. But I managed to get it sorted pretty quickly. And then we stood there and looked at each other and, and you know, shook my head and we did some silly, silly stuff and off we went. And we're Look, just... th this is, <laughs> uh, you know, this is one of those absolute magic moments in music. I'm so <laughs> glad someone had enough brains to, to film this. There's so much fun and that backstory. It just makes it all the more remarkable because I can imagine your mind, you're, you're still just, your brain's just fried. I'm thinking of how is this going to happen? But the way you two play, the friendship, for my money, Tommy, there will probably never be a better acoustic guitar player than Tommy. Yeah. He's taken that instrument. I know his hero was Chet Atkins and, and Chet was wonderful. To be fair, I think Tommy's taken it way beyond where Chet left it. You know, mm. he's just amazing. But yeah. the fact that you could stand there beside that level of guitarist and hold your own, it's a real credit to you, Michael. You should oh, be thank you. Really thank you. Let's have a look and a listen to Michael with Tommy Emmanuel playing the great old jazz standard, Avalon.
classical gas the wonderful piece of music i've been so lucky on on this podcast series i got to converse with robin a smith who wrote the orchestral arrangements for tommy emmanuel for classical gas for his mm-hmm. album wonderful people anyone interested in that check it out on the podcast and i also as i mentioned before got to do a, a an episode with rex go in rex's episode we get to see tommy play this arrangement of classical gas and rex is taking the electric guitarist role that clive lendich does on this version yeah. now there's a great story to this because again this is not an easy piece of music and Tommy's arrangement, which is fully written out for the orchestra, we can't just suddenly go and improvise classical gas with the Sydney Symphony exactly. Orchestra. So, tell, there is a backstory to this one too. How did you end up, I think, on short notice in this position where you were asked to play Tommy's version of classical gas? Give us the backstory on that. Well, I think I think Tommy was double booked. I think um, he, he was intended to play at this event and something else came along and uh, Tommy said, ask me, can, can you do it? I said, I'll give it a go. Yeah. <laughs> Which meant, uh, you know, relearning, unlearning a, a very familiar uh, yeah. arrangement, learning a new, totally new arrangement of it, mm. performing at once and, and that's it. Um, so... I, I had uh, at that time I was playing at the Tamworth uh, Festival, so I had yeah. a whole series of of gigs. Mm. Um, I think that week I did I might have played about twelve or more or more shows. That was the days when you do two shows a day, and mm. Mm. and I made sure that every performance I played classical gas, the new arrangement to try and ah. cement it in place. Yes, uh, because as you say, it's you can't. You no. can't deviate. It's it's written for an orchestra yeah. and you can play it exactly note for note. Um, and gee, it was a challenge. Uh, it it really oh. uh, it got to me. Um, and it wasn't until the last day of the festival, which was the day before Australia Day, when this performance was filmed. Yes, it wasn't until the last concert that I actually got it. That you felt you had it. I felt I had it. That then that gave me enough confidence to go. Well, I've done it once. I, I'm sure I can do it again. Did you have a chance to have a, a rehearsal with the orchestra uh, or not? not? Not really because, and this was another thing, expect the unexpected, you know, mm. you, no matter how prepared you think you are. So in my mind, I'm thinking, well, at least I'll get another two or three runs at it at, mm. a, at a rehearsal. And what happened was it uh, the weather was bad on the day. It rained. And, of course, all the string players, you know, not, we're out of here with, yeah. uh, with expensive yeah. Stuff. So I think we had we might have had one one run through. Yeah. Um. And it was it wasn't hundred percent. No. It was like, well, that's it, you know. And then it, the show started live with that with that performance. Oh, look, this is wonderful, and we'll we'll come in about at the halfway mark here. You're playing here to a crowd of probably two hundred thousand people. I mean, yeah. Australia Day is a big event in in this country and in Sydney. You're there, at, you know, around the harbour. They've got all the fireworks. They've got massive video screens. Yeah. And, and here's little Michael with his acoustic guitar surrounded by a massive orchestra yeah. conducted by, uh, sadly, the late Tommy Tico. Tommy Tico did so much he amazing did. work in Australia of, 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 I think, bridging the gap between classical and non-classical. He, he had a way of bringing those different players together and, uh, and this is a really good example of this incredible symphony orchestra with some modern players in. Uh, Clive Lendich is a wonderful guitar player on electric guitar yeah. here. You're out front on, on the mate on acoustic. Let's have a look at classical gas.
let's talk a little bit about your role as an educator, sharing your knowledge with the wider world. Tell us a bit about that. What sort of stuff do you do in the music education field? Um, I do a variety of things. Uh, I do Skype guitar lessons, sort of one-on-one. I, I do one-on-one personal uh, lessons, so very much in the way that when I used to go and hang out with Tommy and we you know, I'd ask questions and he'd show me stuff. And, uh, that, that, uh, that was so powerful for me. Um, I, I love to, to do that with other people. If, if uh, there's something that I can show them, if, if there's something that enhances somebody's musical journey, that's, that's fantastic for me. I enjoy that so much. I do some guitar camps. I've been a tutor at the, um, at Tommy's camp now, for, I think four, four or five times. Okay. That's that's just always. I, I always learn as as much as I teach at those things. Um, Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, I do sort of workshops in um, to do with stagecraft, to do with performance, uh, to do with anxiety and uh, and nerves and uh, dealing with all that stuff, um, getting ready for performances, preparation, all that sort of thing. It's it's based on the idea. And these these are the things I, I probably enjoy the most because of the impact it has on someone. Somebody who 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 says, um, you know, I've learned I've learned this piece. I really want to play these for people, but when I do, I I tense up and I play make mistakes and I my throat goes dry and blah blah. You know, the, all the the usual stuff that. Mm. That we all face, we yeah. all confront, and and it's. I realised it's a common experience, whether you're Tommy, or whether you're a, a a beginner doing your first your first concert or open mic or whatever. Yeah, it's the same things. It's it's a mental game, and uh, and you know I've I have suffered from anxiety, and to the point where it 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 affected my enjoyment of performing to the point where I nearly wanted to, to give up or came close to, to giving up performing. Um, How did you get, that's a common, that is a common story in the music industry. How did you get through that? How did you turn that corner? Um, By, (laughs) there's the, the message. Breathe. Breathe. Yeah. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. Yeah, I found the thing that helped me the most was uh, to do deep breathing exercises. Yeah. Uh, Before performances, I would, um, uh, stand in front of a mirror in the dressing room and instead of, um, you know, playing stuff on the guitar, my focus was I'm going to relax as much as I possibly can. And uh, I would um, stand in front of a mirror, make myself really tall, put my chest out. I would look look into the mirror and talk to myself. I would be doing stretches and, and letting all the tension out of my shoulders and out through my fingertips and, um, and doing really slow, deep breathing while I'm telling myself what a fantastic night I'm going to have and how good I'm feeling and how the audience is going to enjoy this. And, you know, talk to myself, um, get rid of those doubtful negative voices that seem to invade so easily. Um, That's wonderful. That's wonderful advice. It's a, a, common thread through the guests I've had on, on this podcast. And and I've had some wonderful guests, but you hit it on the head. We're all human. That's a human reaction. You know, I'm going to, they're all going to be looking at me. I've got, whether it's 10 people or 200,000 people, our brain just seems to go into that fight or flight mode. Yeah. Yeah. But that's wonderful advice. Breathe, even having it written on your guitar. Wow. And that's part of the, you know, the preparation that what I was talking about earlier about that my, my sort of routine for getting a song up, putting pressure on myself and, and ratcheting that up little by little, putting more and more pressure on um, to prepare yourself for just about anything. Um, yeah. The thing I tell myself is I want to practice a song to a point where I can imagine I'm in the middle of a performance and uh, somebody, uh, a woman carrying a huge tray of glasses, walks past me in the front row, trips over and smashes it. Yeah, and you life know, goes on for you. It has to go it, on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That yeah. I can, that I can just carry on, or because 
every, things happen every time you you step outside of your comfort zone and yes. play somewhere, whether it's to yes. one person or an open mic or a concert, mm. doesn't really matter. Mm. Some there things change. People cough, phones ring, a fight breaks out, a siren uh, you, you know goes yeah. by. Mm. The sound is strange. There's a bit of feedback. There's there's an endless things that happen that create this turmoil in your brain if you haven't prepared for it. In the, the COVID lockdown period, you did a wonderful duo performance with a guitarist called Richard Gillowitz. Now, is, is Richard from the USA? Yes, he is, yeah. Uh, and Richard. this is a song called Echoes from the Past. This mm -hmm. is, tell us a bit about this. This is a beautiful clip. Um, yeah, it's a it's a a tune that I wrote quite a long time ago. It's it's one of the old older ones, and it uh, it's still I still perform it from time to time. And Richard was coming out here quite regularly, and and we were doing some shows together. And uh, he's he's a, a a wonderful player, and and a quite quite different from me. He's very much from the if if you were to say I'm from the more the Chet Atkins school, Richard is more from the Leo Kotke school. Okay. It's quite it's almost like upside down guitar it's a yeah. rhythm it's it it's different it's it's something difficult for me to get my head around sometimes or oftentimes let's have a look and listen this is an absolutely beautiful clip echoes from the past
what's been your involvement in recording music specifically for the purpose of offering it as production music, music licensing? Tell us about that. Yeah. Um, well, it, it started in the mid nineties, uh, for me, um, I sort of stumbled into it quite by accident by I was, I just moved to Brisbane. I'd been asked if I would be interested in composing music for a, a documentary and, um, I had to submit a budget and I didn't know what I should charge as a composer. And I thought, well, I discovered through reading that there was this, this thing called production music it was, it was called library music in those days. Yeah. And it was sort of dismissed as something as like generic music that's in the background of a TV show. And, and a lot of it was pretty uh, cheaply produced using MIDI instruments and that sort of thing. So it, it didn't have a great reputation if uh, mm. it was probably why people avoided, you know, getting into library music. But I thought, um, well, I should find out how much it costs to use library music for something like this. And then that gives me a base level and I can put work out. Yeah. My feet. So I ended up getting in touch with a company in Sydney called Production Music Services and got chatting to them. And, um, the, the the woman there, Barbara, was so incredibly helpful and uh, invited me to submit music uh, and saying, you know, we're always looking for new composers. So I'd recorded two albums at that stage, um, two, maybe, maybe three, uh, and they were, the first two albums I recorded were a real mixture of electric and acoustic guitar, and there was a lot of original material on there. And I sent those through, and very soon after, she got back in touch and offered me a project, which was to create um, music, uh, like a CD, 70, 70 minutes worth of music uh, that was in a style of sort of colonial Australian bush music. Okay. That was like, yep, I, I know exactly what she means. I played with the bushwhackers. I was familiar with the songs, the style. Yeah. Um, I put together a bush band. I went into a studio, recorded a bunch of tracks and... Um, submitted them and that was nearly 30 years ago and i still hear some of those tracks to this day and in, in the background of some yeah know, or whatever yeah it's my introduction to production music and i thought gee this is pretty good that was that was really fun and um it just developed from there i ended up doing maybe four projects a year for um for this company they're now they're now called beatbox okay um, and uh, in, in recent years, uh, through the pandemic, I, I decided to really ramp up my, my output and submit to various companies because there are hundreds and hundreds of production music companies around the world. Yes. And submit, they're, they're linked in with um, uh, services like Netflix and, and Apple TV, and then they're linked yeah. in with uh, all the, the major players all over the world, at TV networks. Uh, mm advertising company so wherever music is used um you know there's potential for licensing um so i'd become a bit more adept at writing music to a brief uh and right yeah so having a studio and having uh, the ability to compose music to a to a deadline and mm. often budget um, are important skills and um something i found i really enjoyed and it it sort of became um for me, a foundation, a sort of the income generated through that is my my foundation, which means I don't have to be touring 12 months of the year. I'm often confronted when I say, have you heard Tommy Emmanuel? And I quote here, oh, he can't be much of a guitar player. He doesn't sing. <laughs> and I, and I, immediately, I immediately in my brain park that person, like okay, he's in category, whatever I'm going to call that category, because I don't think I can help that guy. But I need to ask you, do you sing on stage or has it always been just the guitar? Um, I do sing uh, and I, I enjoy singing. I sing enough to surprise people, for people to go, oh, I didn't know you could sing. Yeah. But not enough for people to go, mm, maybe you should stick to the guitar. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I think that's a great that's a great answer. I've always been a firm believer that there are people that can sing and there's the rest of us who let's have a go and let's have a bit of fun at it, but let's mm. not make too much of a habit of, of, of airing the dirty laundry. Now, Christine is a wonderful singer. Yeah, she's incredible. So let's have a, a look at a little bit, just the end of summertime. 
you do some great sort of stuff here on the guitar. And Christine lets us know with her last note of, of what breath control really is all about. Michael, making a living as a professional musician based in Australia, and you're based in Brisbane now, what's your advice on piecing together a decent living as a professional musician? Well, I think these days for um, somebody, a young person coming in, um, is it's learn as much as you can about all areas of the music business and be prepared to diversify um you know you could uh, yes there are people who will do one thing and one thing only and do it so well that they will succeed at it like a tommy emmanuel uh you know if you're if you're a dedicated guitar player and that's what you want to do um it's going to be a long and and tough road um and you need incredible persistence and determination and uh, be living off the smell of an oily rag, but uh, but people do it. Uh, Daniel Champagne is a, is a, a an example of a young young guy who's doing who's been doing that for I don't know fifteen years or more, probably going on twenty years now. Who is pursuing that path, and it's taken twenty years to get to the point where you regularly see sold out at his concerts. Right, uh, but that's that's kind of what it takes that total all in commitment, um, or What's more likely to happen is be prepared to diversify your talent. Um, don't turn your nose up at opportunities to teach or to learn about recording or to learn composition or it's about learning, learn, learn, learn as much as you can, because you just never know what uh, stuff excites you and what 
uh, opportunities come along and it's it's sort of like being <clears throat> preparing yourself for for all possible scenarios in 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 my own my own life um i think because there was i was genuinely excited about a lot of things that would come along i'd never say no um you know an opportunity came along say to to create production music even though i didn't really know how do you do that can i can i write an album of you know 70 minutes worth of of colonial australian music well never done that before but let's let's study it let's have a listen to what's there and you know let's learn about it and, let, and that led right. that door opening led to a whole a career path for me uh likewise um you know start when i was in my teenage years I, I got very interested in very basic recording i'm talking so basic as a microphone plugged into a cassette deck <laughs> yeah we've all been there in that era yeah, yeah. And, and um and then a, a friend of mine who had who was interested in electronics said i've got a kit here for a reverb unit you put the microphone in the reverb unit and you'll sound you'll sound better you know <laughs> so yeah okay let's okay. have a go at that you know yeah. this this sort of have have an attitude of of give everything a go and, yes. and even if something that is turns out to be not such a good experience you learn from it yeah um and uh, i've i've always been that have had that curiosity about stuff and uh, it's it's sort of never really been my thing to say no to things without considering it first, you know. And, and you whatever. seem to have led a really balanced life. I guess that's something I want to ask you. If you had the chance to go back and talk to your younger self, when you just think back on your life and have a little chat to that, you know, 12-year-old, 14-year-old, whatever, Michael, with everything you've learnt and been through, would you largely do what you've done or what advice uh, might you give your younger self? Um. Yeah, one one uh, piece of advice that uh, I learned the hard way is if if you're doing something and the only reason you're doing it is for the money, if that's the best justification you can come up with, if your gut is saying, oh, I, this is really, I'm not comfortable doing this, but the money's good, that never worked for me. <laughs> <laughs> that I I tend. haven't I don't think it's worked for anyone. I actually had the chance to to talk to a great Nashville session player, and and his advice was exactly what you just said. I said to him, you know, if you had your time over again, he he almost word for word said, if he had his life over again, he would never do something if it was just for the money. We're all sort of different in terms of. Um, what makes us feel comfortable. And, and I think I discovered during the pandemic that I'm essentially an introverted person. Yeah. And, um, and I thought, geez, it has, how come it's taken me until the age of 60 to learn this about myself, yeah. to learn such a, what, what's really such a big yeah. piece of your personality, whether you're an introvert or an extrovert and people yeah. assume if you're a performer, you must be an extrovert. Yeah. Um, well, I, I can I can tell you honestly that being on a stage as a soloist is not a comfortable place for me. It's not no. something I'm, you know, absolutely. I've got to be on that stage. I've got to play. Mm. I've got to prepare myself, remind myself that I can do it. Get those negative thoughts out of my mind, and so I'm there for the people. And yeah. um, it 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 doesn't come totally natural and and the more people i've spoken to the more i realize that's pr that's a pretty normal thing so it's um you know i would say to younger people too it's it you're learning about yourself you're learning lessons about your own personality it's one thing to have a have this uh, vision in your mind of you're up on a stage and you're commanding an audience and people are yelling and cheering but this between where you are now and that spot there's so much learning to do, and and so much of that learning is about how you perform under pressure, the things that make you who you are, the things that make you special, the things that people want to connect with, uh, and they, those lessons take a long, long time to learn. And it's, it's great that you're still learning. Life's about learning. Oh, absolutely. And, and yeah. I think the things that make you happy. Michael, the best way for people to get in touch with you if they want to have a lesson, they want to buy some stuff. I assume is it your website 
yeah, yeah, Michael. That's the best way. Com yep. is the yeah, the, is the door, the portal to all things in my world. <laughs> Have you got anything coming up that you want to share with the audience? Anything special? Uh, What's on, yeah, the on the horizon? The horizon. Um, I'm p playing at the uh, Noosa Guitar Festival, which is coming up in a few weeks in November. I'm not sure yes. when it's going out, but. Uh, uh, next, early next year, early 2025, March, April, I'll be touring with Christine Collister. She's coming back after five years, and uh, we're we're really excited about uh, reuniting and and uh, you know getting that project uh, out out in public again. Um, it's something I, I really enjoy collaborating with her. A great thing with this podcast, something I, I thoroughly enjoy, is with all of my guests. Not only do we get to talk about music. We actually get to make a little bit of music together. And we've done a collaboration on a beautiful song of yours called Peace of Mind. You actually re-recorded a video for this podcast. It's beautiful. And I get to play a little bit of the concert flute with you. I just heard, as soon as I heard your guitar, I thought, I think of all my instruments, the flute is what I could hear. Do you want to tell us a bit about Peace of Mind? How did, what, what's that? the background of that song? Yeah, it's, it's quite an old one um, off one of one of my early albums. And it's one of those uh, tunes, it's, it kind of, um, over the years, it's sort of slipped away and I'd forgotten about it. And um, just recently, um, I, I noticed uh, in my royalty statements, there was a peace of mind was appearing and it had quite a spike. Okay. And uh, and then I discovered it. some guy in India had picked, picked up the tune, was using it in, he has a travel channel. It was okay, it. yeah. So, <laughs> and it sort of reminded me of the tune and I, I thought, um, yeah. I started playing it again and thought, yeah, yeah it's, this, is a, this is a nice tune. I, like, I, I enjoy playing it. It makes me feel good to play oh. it. So I just, just this last six months, I've put it back into the concert set. Yeah, it's a great, it's a great song. Thanks so much, Michael, for being part of this series. It's been a, a real pleasure talking to you and playing yeah. with you on Peace of Mind. Uh, Bye for enjoyed, now. Enjoyed the chat. See you. Thank you.